This is Transparency, a podcast by Gender Dysphoria Alliance, hosted by Aaron Kimberly and Aaron Terrell. Each week we'll be joined by people who have personal or professional experience with gender dysphoria and physical transition. We'll also discuss how our trans experiences relate to the concept of gender identity. Join us for a compassionate yet heterodox approach to the question of trans. Dr. Julia Mason is a board-certified pediatrician and fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She is a graduate of the University of Illinois and completed residency training in pediatrics at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. In the past several years, she's encountered an increasing number of gender dysphoric adolescents, most with neurodevelopmental challenges or psychiatric comorbidities. Last week, the AAP Board of Directors voted to reaffirm their 2018 policy statement on gender-affirming care, but with an important announcement that they will conduct a systematic review of the evidence and revise their guidance for pediatricians accordingly. Dr. Mason has been a leading advocate for that systematic review, so we were excited to have her join us to tell us more. And here's our conversation with Dr. Mason. All right, welcome back to Transparency. I am Aaron Terrell, um, obviously with my co-host, 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 that's what it is, uh, Aaron Kimberly. uh, And uh, we are very delighted to have uh, Julia, Dr. Julia Mason uh, with us today. I feel like this has been a long time coming, getting you uh, on the pod to chat with us, but I think this is now perfect timing uh, in light of, yeah, the recent events over at the AAP. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I, it's a, uh, it's a good day. <laughs> I wonder if we could start um, just because some of our viewers may not be familiar with all of the concepts that we're going to introduce. So if maybe you could explain what the, the AAP is and what their function and role is. Yeah. Yeah. So the American Academy of Pediatrics is a professional organization of pediatricians. I think you do need to be board certified. I don't know if they keep track of whether you maintain your certification, but in order to join, you need to be a board certified pediatrician. And, and then it's, it's basically, it's a trade union. It's a professional union. You know, they're there to look out for pediatricians. But of course, if you're the American Academy of Pediatrics, what you say is we're looking out for kids, you know, so they will lobby for things like Medicaid expansion the CHIP program, which was a way to get more kids covered by insurance. It was a lot more important before Obamacare, but it's still it's still important. And they do a lot of uh, lobbying about gun safety because it's often little kids that find, you know, unsecured guns and, and tragedy ensues. So they claim um, 65 or 67,000 members and they definitely don't have every pediatrician in the country. And there was a big schism at least 10 years ago. Um, I'm not sure of the year, but the, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with a position statement saying that they supported the rights of gay couples to adopt children that, you know, that children can be well raised in a, you know, in a family with two, two moms or two dads. And there was a group of conservative pediatricians who were sort of like, that's it, that's a bridge too far, I'm out. And they formed something called the American College of Pediatricians, the ACP. And the ACP um, has a website and they do things. And and I've I've talked I've talked to people there, you know, they're 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 nice enough people, but they don't have a lot of members. Um, it's important to remember the AAP doesn't represent all pediatricians because you've got to pay like $700 a year to be a member. And then what do you get? I don't know. You get to say FAAP after your name. And there might be families who are looking for that when they're choosing a pediatrician. Doesn't seem to be the case in my town. My boss is not and never has been a member of the AAP, but it's a, it's a, it's a big organization. It has a multi-million dollar budget and most of their budget is not our $700 a year membership fees cuz i looked into that cuz i wondered whether you know like if a bunch of us threatened to you know to stop renewing our membership would would they care and i realized no they wouldn't care at all they get most of their money from like they have organizations they have they have uh 
They have contracts with formula companies, with drug companies, even with the Melissa and Doug toy company, you know, the one that makes all the nice wooden toys. Yeah. So they have some kind of agreement with the AAP. So AAP is huge and it has, it has the appearance. This is what I think now after years, it has the appearance of democracy. There is a president of the AAP and we have an election every two years. But now that I've thought about it, we are presented with two candidates and there is no open primary system, you know, so the leadership presents us with two candidates and then we can pick from those two and then they become the president elect and they're the president elect for two years. And I feel now like they're getting kind of trained up into what it's like to be in the AAP leadership and how that works. And then they spend two years as the acting AAP president. And then they spend two years as the immediate past president. And so they are three of the 16 members of the AAP board of directors. And the CEO of the AAP is a lawyer, Mark Del Monte. And uh, he's, you know, he has been leading the AAP for more than 10 years. And so I feel like if anybody's in charge, it's it's Mark Del Monte. It's not really, you know, it's not really the person who's got the title of president of the AAP. I'm pretty sure almost everything a president of the AAP says has been written for them. Sounds a little bit like you know, a like a democracy. A, a democracy like like uh, parenting a three year old would be a democracy. Do you want to wear this shirt I picked out for you or this shirt I picked out for right. you? Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But is that Just is that normal choices? Or like is, is from if you know with other medical organizations is that usual to be the, the, the uh, basically the, the CEO the head honcho uh -huh. uh, not actually a physician of any kind to be a, a lawyer is that I don't know I do not know if it's if how many medical organizations are headed up by a non doctor I wouldn't be surprised though because if you're a doctor you've spent years training to be a doctor right you don't really right. want to like set that all aside to run an organization of doctors, like that's yeah. not your personality type. So yeah, if you're sense. the president of the AAP, you're gonna be doing less clinical work for, for six years and a lot less for two years. And that might be worth doing because it's a career move, blah, blah, blah. But but to actually just give up on medicine, I mean, there's, there are definitely thousands and thousands of doctors who don't see patients who, you know, who are up in the administration, but it's not, yeah. The skill set are the skill sets are different. Yeah. And the, yeah, even though it's the sense. American Academy, there, there. Am I correct that there are Canadian members? Yes, there are Canadian members. Well, it's America. It didn't say the United States. That's true. Of pediatrics. <laughs> and uh, and there's definitely like people when you go to the the national conference and exhibition, which is every year in October. Um, there's a lot of people from all over the world who come to uh, to get CME things like that. So it's got some international, I don't know if that's membership, but international participation for the CME events, which I always enjoyed till a few years ago. CME events? Yeah, continuing medical education. Oh, yes, 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 okay. Yeah, so yes, as a, almost every state requires you to have a certain number of CME hours, you know, like I, I continue to learn about medicine. I went to this, I went to that. And so for many years, I, I have used the, the AP meeting as my, as my major source of CME credits, especially if they're in New Orleans or San Francisco. <laughs> really like going there. This so the year they're in Washington, D.C. I'm not going. <laughs> so as an association, so they're not a regulator. They're not, they're not regulating right. practice and they're not, their role isn't to protect the public because so that would be what the College of Physicians that would mm -hmm. be their role, um, but they do or seem the to individual release individual medical boards, right? Yeah. And so it's a little, probably a little bit di different in the U.S. than it is here in in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, so even though they're not a regulator, they seem to release position statements on different different yeah. things. So including gender affirming care. So can you explain yes. to us what their position has been and how do they determine what their position is? Right. So in 2018, they released not not a standard of care and not a guideline, but they released something just called a statement. 
And it was a statement on gender affirming care. And it had, oh dear, I didn't. This is uh, Jason Rafferty, correct? Yes. And it was written by a young doctor. I believe that when he approached the AAP leadership, he was still in training. And it was a statement that was really interesting because it broke new ground in in what was considered normal normal management of kids with gender dysphoria. So this statement laid out that if you have a child who's who presents with gender dysphoria, there are three things you can do. And the first thing you can do is try to talk them out of it. And that's conversion therapy. And then they had all these references that were two papers about doing bad things to adult male homosexuals, like had nothing to do with kids. And that's, you know, and that's conversion therapy, it's evil and bad. And then they're like, or you could just hold space. And, you know, we called that watchful waiting. And that was actually the standard of care at the time. And they're like, that is also evil and bad. Or you could affirm them. And if you affirm, there's a social transition and then there's puberty blockers and then there's cross-sex hormones and then there's surgeries. And they basically presented that that is your only reasonable option. And that went out pretty quietly, to be perfectly honest. Like I found, I like I got involved, I got worried about this at about that time. And yet I wasn't clever enough to look on my own AAP website, like looking at that. Um, I found James Cantor's takedown called fact checking the AAP, which is a thing you might want to link to, <laughs> um, called fact checking. I found that before I found the original, um, statement. And so it just kind of went out fairly quietly, um, or else I'm overwhelmed and just didn't notice the email, whatever. Um, but it has, uh, expired well it it was up it was due to expire this year because traditionally aap statements are good for five years and so 2023 is five years after 2018 and they just had the aap leadership meeting and they do that near the headquarters which is a suburb of chicago and at that meeting the 16 member board for the AP did two things. First, they um, apparently unanimously said, we're going to continue with the statement. We're going to re-up the statement. But then they said, and we're going to commission a systematic review of the evidence and maybe do some updating. And so it was like, a, I don't know, it was weird. It, it was an interesting... It, it seems, an interesting weird. It seems weird to me. Yeah, it seems weird to me that they would just take you know, one young physician's word on this, you know, yeah. and, and accept that as, a, you know, an organization wide position. That, that, I mean, that doesn't seem like usual practice, is it? No, it really doesn't seem like usual practice. And this statement had an unusual feature, which was a sentence that said, Dr. Jason Rafferty is solely responsible for the content of the statement. And I've that's never so seen bizarre. that. I haven't gone through all the other things, but that struck me as really unusual. So somebody, somebody involved in publishing this was was feeling uncertain about it. You know, there was somebody who was like, oh. and so they, they put this weird little disclaimer in there. But then it also got sent to various committees, which approved it. But nobody, nobody fact checked it. Nobody like, I mean, I guess it got copy edited. I don't remember any typos, but nobody checked the content. Nobody checked the references. They just took this thing from this young doctor who, um, who trained at Brown. He is a protege of Michelle Forcier. And if any of your uh, listeners, watchers have seen Matt Walsh's uh, documentary, What is a Woman?, she was maybe the star of that documentary because she's the chicken lady. She's the one where he was saying, you know, like, you know, you know, you know, the the chicken is a hen because she lays eggs. And she said, can a chicken cry? 
<laughs> can a chicken commit suicide? And he's like, uh. <laughs> so Michelle Forcier is um, not a part of AAP leadership, but she is an attending at a, you know, at a highly ranked training program. And she trains a lot of doctors and she is what I would call a true believer. You know, this is a, like the, the gender identity is, is very much like a soul. She feels like she can look into a child's eyes and determine their soul, you know, their gendered soul. And if it's this, then that's what it is. And it will never change. And I'm skeptical of that, but, um, that's uh, that's where she's coming from. And then Dr. Rafferty was just a brand new pediatrician. And I've talked at length in other places about what Dr. Stephen Levine calls the chain of trust. You know, so when you are learning medicine, you're drinking from the fire hose, right? Like there's all this information and more coming at you and you do not have the brain with the bandwidth or the brain space to individually confirm all the facts that you're being given. You just have to take them on trust. You have to be like, I'm a medical student. These are my teachers. They're telling me this is the way it is. This is the way it is. And so I can't really blame him because he was just right there, you know, and he was soaking in it. And so he picked that up. And I imagine that he went to the AP leadership and he was like, ooh, ooh, you know, like there's a new civil rights movement and the AAP needs to be on the right side of history. Trans is the new gay and, you know, trans rights are human rights and blah, 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 you know, <laughs> and the, the leadership, which is uh, older people and people who kind of were there through the whole <clears throat> gay rights movement and maybe, maybe feeling a little bit bad about how quickly they stepped onto that train. They're like, oh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm for this. I'm for this. If this is the new civil rights movement, then I am for it. And so whatever you say, just why don't you write something up and we'll take a look. And he wrote something up and somebody was a little nervous about it. They got that, that little disclaimer put in there, but generally it just, it just got published. And then it was, all, it was left to people like James Cantor, who's a sexologist who knows those references to kind of take a look at it and go, this does not, this does not fit with what I understand about the, you know, the current yeah. state of the literature. And that wasn't enough for them to kind of question maybe they're, they were wrong. They just circled the wagons is my impression. You know, it's very much like there's that phrase. It's not the, it's the cover up, not the crime. I think that they, they made a mistake in just taking this document from this young doctor and not fact checking it. And then when people started pointing out that it had errors, they were just like, mm, 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 no, nope, not listening. You know, we're just gonna, and maybe that's what happens when your organization is run by a lawyer. <laughs> Cause Good to point. admit that you made a mistake opens you up to lawsuits, but also the longer you refuse to admit that you make a mistake, I feel like the lawsuits get worse, but I am not a lawyer. So, so this, know. this move to, you know, basically reaffirm that statement, but with the caveat that they would do a systematic review. I mean, that seems like part of the process of backing out. Yes, it very much does. And so I'm glad to see it. My prediction is that they're going to slowly over time change the definition of affirmative care while loudly proclaiming that they are for affirmative care and they always have been. So they'll be like, we haven't changed our mind. We've never changed our mind. But what we're the actual specifics of what we're recommending have are have changed drastically. They already did this. So let's see. Well, first, first I want to um give a little history on me and the AAP. Yeah, because, I was hoping you could tell the story of yeah, you've yeah, been trying when, when, to get them to do this for a long time now. Yeah, get this more in chronological order. So the statement came out in 2018. I didn't actually see it when it came out, but pretty soon after it came out, I saw James Cantor's because I started to look around and I found that. And that's just because I had more and more patients. And I sent a patient to the clinic that I really thought was going to be sort of um, differential diagnosed out. Like my first kid that I sent to the gender clinic was like, yeah, you know, like I could totally see it. And she had the story of lifelong, you know, identification. But then the second one, she came in with her mom 
And I don't know, I just, just didn't seem legit to me, but I'm like, well, I'm just the pediatrician. I'll send you the gender clinic. And they affirmed. And then I'm like, wait a second. And I started to realize that every single person going to that clinic got the same diagnosis. Like they, it was a one-way trip. And so I went to the 2019 um, AAP national meeting which was in New Orleans. This is before the pandemic. So it's a big gathering of people all in one place. Remember those? And uh, thousands of people, like five or 10,000 10, pediatricians come to these meetings. They are huge. And there was a, uh, there was a presentation of, about pediatric gender medicine and they put it in a double-sized room because they, like, they knew it would be of high interest, but the room was packed and there were three doctors there who all did transition of minors and they were thrilled to see the room was full and it was obvious that they thought the room was full because we were all there because we wanted to know how we could be life-saving heroes like them you know so they they all considered themselves to be life-saving heroes they had it they had it stuck in their heads that like these kids are just going to die if you don't, if you don't give them what they want. And, and I do, and now they're happy and yay me. And then, you know, they, it's traditional that you can ask questions at the end. And so I did, I stood up and I asked a question. I don't remember what it was, but it was a skeptical question. And after, and I was the last one to be able to ask a question and so then immediately, like, you know, they turned off the microphones and everything. And I got mobbed by all these pediatricians who were in that room. And they were like, oh, thank you so much for asking that question. I'm concerned myself. I don't understand what's going on. And I thought, yeah, the majority of pediatricians mm-hmm. in this room are just here because we're trying to figure out what's going on. This doesn't make sense. And we're trying to figure it out. So that was my experience in 2019. I also went to my regional meeting. This was like an early morning meeting. And my region is, I'm in I'm in Portland, Oregon. I practice in Gresham, Oregon. And my region is Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Alaska, Hawaii. And uh, they all presented various things. This is how we're getting kids to exercise in Alaska and, you know, eat better in Hawaii and blah, blah, blah. And then when we got to the, you can ask questions part, I asked a question that said, I'm worried about what's going on here. And wow, like if people had lasers in their eyes, I would have been dead at that point. <laughs> but um, there was one guy I had to just like look at him and go, yes, I see you glaring at me. You can stop now. But the guy at the dais, and I can't remember what his title is, but the area leader, he was like, oh, what you need to do is you need to submit a resolution to the annual leadership conference. And that's how rank and file pediatricians can try to influence what the AP does. And I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. And I sat back down and then the meeting continued. And then when it was over, I went up front and I'm like, okay, submitting a resolution. How do I do that? Where do I, you know, where do I send it? What's going on with that? Who do I talk to? And he, he shared all the information with me and he was perfectly friendly, but I got an impression that telling people to write a resolution was sort of his go-to strategy for annoying people because most people won't do it, you know, but I was already a member of Segum at that point. And, uh, and so I knew that I had people who could help me actually write a resolution. And as it turned out, like the deadline was in a week, it was crazy. Um, but I put in two resolutions And to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure if I used the term systematic review of the evidence in those first ones, but it was about, you know, we need to back off on what we're saying here, but because there was just a week, I didn't get a sponsor and the meeting, the meetings used to be in the spring, but that was the spring of 2020 and it was the pandemic and the lockdown. And so it was a zoom meeting and I attended via zoom and they got to my resolutions and they're like, this is an unsponsored resolution. Does anybody second this? And it was silent. And then, and then they said, okay, moving on, you know, so my first resolution kind of died a quiet death and then they changed the whole timing. So that was kind of my 2020 resolution, even though I submitted it in 2019. And then in 2021, a different pediatrician who I didn't know at the time, I know her now, Sarah Palmer, she submitted a resolution with similar concerns 
And I got to know her after she submitted her resolution. And she actually, at the meeting, which again was virtual, um, somebody did second it. So it went for a vote, but then it got voted down. And then in 22, I submitted a resolution. And that's that's the one where I'm quite clear. I said, what, what I want the AP do, to do is a systematic review of the evidence. Because at that point, Finland and Sweden and England have all had all done systematic reviews of the evidence and found the evidence to be very, very weak and poor. So I that was my only ask. AAP should be a systematic review of the evidence. I had four co four co-authors, so there were five of us. And uh we couldn't get, you know, we couldn't get a second. And so it didn't get voted. But it was online. They did a new thing because of the pandemic. They put all the resolutions online and they sent us emails saying, hey, go and look at the resolutions. You can comment, you know, you can do things like that. And we got a lot of comments and of the people who bothered to vote, it was like three to one or four to one positive, you know? So like the rank and file pediatricians thought that was a good idea. And then this year I submitted one with 23 co-sponsors. So there were 24 of us and uh, it said this, it, it was, you know, it had new facts, but the, the ask was the same that the AP do a systematic review of the evidence and they did not put it online. <laughs> and it's a whole, like, basically they just kept coming up with more reasons why nobody could see what I was doing. And I was, I just said something wrong because it was Sarah Palmer's resolution that got a lot of engagement online. And then the next year they said, if your resolution is unsponsored, nobody can interact with it. So in 22 and hers had been unsponsored, hers had been unsponsored. So they made a new rule, right? So basically they made a new rule. If your resolution's unsponsored, then nobody can leave a comment and nobody can give it a thumbs up or down. And that then voting the, the thumbs up or down. Sorry to interrupt. But is that, is it anonymous? It's 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 no, it's not. It's not anonymous. Oh. Oh. It is not anonymous. And it's kind of like, it's hidden from the public. Like you can't go and look. Um, but I have, I have in my possession, you know, I have a document where I, I downloaded everything. And so I can see who, yeah, who said yes and who knows. So those are like, if I was more clever at being able to figure out email addresses, maybe I could write all these people. Um, I was just thinking it probably the, the, I think a lot of like why nobody seconded your resolution in that meeting was, you know, the, uh, you know, silencing spiral type type deal. Right. Whereas if you can go on on the resolutions and vote yay or nay anonymously, I feel like that would have gotten. Oh, much I, higher. Think, I think that if you did, if we had a, a truly anonymous vote, if we polled the American Academy of Pediatrics members. Yeah, things would be different. It's really weird. This is just such a weird topic. And we see it over and over again where the public is in one place and the leadership is in another place. And I think the leadership is telling themselves, well, all civil rights movements are unpopular at first. And so we're just pushing ahead. We're on the right side of history, et cetera. And that has been the case in the past, you know, just, this is just this one, this, just this one seems to be, I don't know, wolf in sheep's clothing or something. Yeah, yeah. You think where where irreversible medical interventions come along, it's kind of different from uh, all all previous uh, yeah. civil rights issues. But yeah, yeah. I'm the, no doctor. The, well, yeah, I can tell you the 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 medical implications are huge, definitely. <laughs> well, especially so, when this when what has become of what we think of as as the affirmation model because i mean that's changed over the years too right i mean what mm -hmm. you said earlier about how they'll probably keep the language but change the definition i mean that's already happened multiple times since the affirmation model first rolled out from from the netherlands um because it, it used to mean assessment and and diagnosis it, it, from what i understand like there was a screening yeah. process in the original model and there was an expectation of of diagnosis in the original model but then it's become what is probably better described as just a a, a informed consent only model or a harm reduction model maybe All right, yeah yeah and it's worth noting that the original dutch protocol discouraged social transition 
they 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 even they even have language where you know a mom might be like okay this is my daughter and they're like no this is your son who would rather be a girl and in the future we might be able to do things to help him look more like a girl but you know don't don't be changing everything you so, know why they didn't uh i'm just really curious about this why the uh-huh. dutch discourage social transition and why it's so oh yeah cheerlead cheerlead or whatever that term would be over here well I think the reason you don't want to encourage it is because young children are what I would call pre-logical, right? So it's around the age of eight that a kid really starts to think about things, you know, in, in terms of cause and effect. Prior to that, they are brilliant at noticing cause and effect. And that's how a two year old can manipulate their parents. Cause I I always say a three year old does a three year old does 3000 things every day. And three of them work and they always remember which three. And so they're just like doing things all the time and they have much better memories than we do. And so they just, they're doing science in their own life, you know, but they don't understand things. They really don't. And so a lot of what I do as a pediatrician is try to remind parents that there is no way to talk a young child into better behavior. They do not behave because you explained to them why they need to behave. They literally behave because you told them to, which is weird and it seems un-American and all that, but that is just, that's just the developmental fact. Little kids do things because they trust you and you told them to. And so like, you know, the very, the foundation of a child's psychological health is trust versus mistrust. And that is, that is developed in the first year. So in the first year of life, when they cried, did somebody respond? When they were hungry, did somebody feed them? When they were uncomfortable, did somebody help them out? And if that was solid, then they trust their caregivers. And then for the next seven years, basically they do things because they were told. They don't do things because they figured out it's, you know, they they don't weigh the pluses and minuses. Like once they're eight, you can say, you know, if you leave Legos on the floor, it hurts my feet and I'm, I feel like throwing them all away. And then the kid's like, oh, I better pick up the Legos, you know, but if they're five, it's just like, Joey, pick up the Legos, you know? And, and so if you tell a child of three, four five, six, seven years that, um, you know, the fact that you want to wear dresses and paint your, um, fingernails and grow your hair out means that uh, there's something wrong with you. You're, you're, you have a, a boy, a girl's brain in a boy's body, but it's okay because we're going to just like, we're going to, we'll, we'll all pick out a new name together and we're going to send you to kindergarten and tell everybody you're a girl and we'll use she, her pronouns. And then when you're older, the doctors will change your sex. And if you say that to a small child, they believe that it's really going to happen. They ask questions about, you know, like when I am a mommy and, you know, all this kind of stuff, they, they, I mean, you know, they have great faith in the powers of adult. I mean, we do amazing things, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. I think that cars and airplanes and I think the Dutch that age 12 was the very er- earliest that they would recommend a social transition. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. And only then I, if it had very persistent gender dysphoria from a young age. Yeah. Yeah. But over here in the United States and I think Canada, people are doing social transitions and it's all, you know, it's all fun and games until puberty starts. And then it just gets deadly serious because the medical side effects of blocking puberty at its onset are severe. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the parents understand that. I know the kids don't understand that. Well, I don't think parents, so, you know, hypothetical, hypothetical parent takes their child to a gender clinic. I don't think they're being told, well, did you know that the vast majority of time childhood onset gender dysphoria is highly correlated with homosexuality? So chances mm-hmm. are, odds are, based on the research, A, your child will probably grow up to be gay, and B, especially if they're boy, and yeah. B, there's... 12, 13 studies that all say by the time they're an adult, they'll have adapted to a gay identity and this 
gender dysphoria or this you know strong desire to be the opposite sex will shed off that's not what these families are being told no no they aren't no they all it's really weird you know because i'll 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 talk about in the before times you know so like in the before times it was known that 66 to 80 something percent maybe even 90 percent of kids with a cross-sex identification would desist you know as they hit puberty and as they had um what stella o'malley calls their sexual awakening you know because when when you're little you don't think in terms of who you're attracted to, but that that's part of puberty is starting to figure out who you're attracted to. And yeah, for a lot of the kids and, and especially the classic, the classic effeminate boy, he, he gets to be old, you know, he gets to be 12, 13 and he gets a crush on somebody. And then he's like, Oh, <laughs> that explains a few things. So yeah, we've blocked that pathway. And I don't know, you know, that was, that was part of, uh, the staff at the Tavistock clinic, which is the, which was the world's largest pediatric gender clinic in, in London. There was, there was staff sort of joking to each other that soon there would be no gay people left in England because they were all being transed, which is horrible to think about. There is some, and I'm just worried. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's some, I was just thinking of, of cases in history where activism has displaced, has really changed the course of a medical practice. And I guess there is precedent in, in terms of um, the activism involved in removing homosexuality from the DSM. I guess that would be one, one precedent, but I think the, the key difference between that is that that wasn't in direct con contradiction to the evidence. Whereas yes. I feel, I feel like what's happening with the, you know, the influence of activism on medical practice, it's in direct contra contradiction to the, all the evidence about what is best practice for, for kids. Yeah. It's just, it's like, we forgot everything we know about child development and we forgot everything we know about adolescent development. It's, it's just all gone out the window in favor of this political ideology you know, and that like identity is more important than anything else. And, you know, when I was, I was a kid in the eighties and there was this whole campaign aimed at gay kids that said it gets better. You know, like I know li life is rough right now. It seems really awful, but it gets better. And all of these adult gay people were, were um, creating sort of short video messages that we're going out to say, look, you know, it was rough for me when I was in high school, but now I'm happy and, you know, it gets better. And there wasn't any medicalization involved, <laughs> you know, it was yeah. just, it was just getting on with your life. But now it's, it's getting onto a path of medicalization with a ton of side effects. And then, you know, I think the harm done, to, if they think they're protecting trans people with these policies, I mean, I think the harm done to people like myself and, and you know, probably you, Aaron, Aaron Terrell as well, but for those of us that had classic gender identity disorder, the, this activism and the, and the blind following of that activism by the medical establishment is really neglecting us because we're, we're not afforded an opportunity to better understand this condition that we've been di diagnosed and treated for. I mean, I've been treated for almost 20 years now for a condition that no one will explain to me what it is. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, if you, if you try to explain it, then you're not a believer and it really feels more like a religion than a scientific field. To me, there are catechisms like trans women are women, trans men yeah. are men, non-binary people are valid. You know, these are just things that you say and you have to believe them. Um, and this I, whole, like, and just what they, when they talk about gender identity, it just sounds like a soul uh -huh. to me. The idea that it's in you, it's internal, eternal and immutable. And I, I just know too many detransitioners for that to for that to sit comfortably in my head. But they 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 uh, manage that by saying, well, it's also fluid and expansive. And oh, yeah. you know, detransition and retransition is just part of that, you know, that uh, well, all part of the gender, gender journey. journey. Yes. Yeah.
yep. the Hendrick journey. But, All right, yeah, so 2022, but... um, it's, it sounds like they were starting to make some some progress. Or... Well, tw- so 2022, they said um, you can't you can't comment. And so then people put comments on the resolution after ours because it was interesting on the website. You could read our resolution, the one with the uh, five authors. You could read it, but then you had to go to a different spot on the page and click. And then it was a drop down list. And then you would select the resolution that you wanted to comment on. And it went directly from 26 to 28. Our resolution was number 27 and it wasn't there. So people were leaving comments on 28 saying, hey, what happened to resolution 27? I wanted to leave a comment. Da, 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 da. And so then this year in 2023, they um, they had a new rule that said the leadership retained the right to determine whether a resolution is necessary. And if we feel that a resolution is not necessary, we're just going to bin it, you know, like it's not even going to show up. And so they came out with that rule before the deadline for submitting it. So you're only allowed four whereases. And I think we used three of the four to talk about why our resolution was necessary. <laughs> and uh, and then with that's the one with the 24 co-sponsors. And then when they did put up the website where you could look at the resolutions and comment, they had a new thing that they said, comments will be moderated. And if the comment is not on the resolution, you know, then it'll be removed. So it was just like on and on. And I figured next year they'd have a, you know, they'd have a new rule. It's like, if your name is Julia Mason, then you're not allowed to submit a resolution. (laughs) They just kept coming up with more and more ways to, to shut me down. And then they had the meeting where, um, My resolution died a quiet death because it didn't have a second, but also they said they're going to do a systematic review of the evidence, which is exactly what I was asking for. And great. Now I should talk a little bit about what a systematic review of the evidence is because it is a particular thing. It is the pinnacle sort of, of evidence-based medicine where the, the weakest way to figure out what to do in medicine is to ask the old dudes, right? Like, you know, ask the experienced doctors, what do you think is the best thing to do? And they say, well, in my experience, blah, 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 you know? So that's, um, a lot of people call that eminence-based medicine instead of evidence-based medicine. And then you get up to like observational studies and then you can get into, yeah. I I just realized, I think we have actually a a weaker, um, method of doing that now which is ask the child what they'd like to do oh you're right it's not even <laughs> <this market. laughs> ask the child what should we do ice cream ice cream every day yeah. um yeah. and so yeah so a systematic review of the evidence is a stronger thing than just a review of the evidence like one of the only reviews of the evidence that people have seen is this thing that's on the yale website said that's like what we know about you know gender affirming care for kids and they i think they use systematic review but it is not a systematic review of the evidence because in order to do a systematic review of the evidence you have to pre-publish your search criteria so before you publish the review you say we're gonna look at all english language or all language you know and from this year to this year that, and these are our keywords for our search. And, you know, this is what we're looking for. And that way, when you then later on publish your review, someone else can be like, well, I ran that search that you published and I found, you know, DeLong et al, in, you know, 2015, and you didn't mention it. So you messed up. You know, it's a way for people to double check that you really did look at everything. And, and then you're supposed to evaluate each of your sources for bias. And that's a key thing. And that's where a lot of the current research falls apart because, and yes, it's going to be almost impossible to do a double blind randomized controlled trial. Like, you know, these are very active interventions. And so you can't really, you can't have a blinded condition. But there are still strong ways, you know, there are still ways to make the evidence, to look at the evidence and to figure out the strength of the evidence. And that's what they did in in Finland and Sweden and England. And in each of those places, they're sort of like, oh, we need to slow down on this. And uh, 
Rita Kertakaltiala, who is a, a child and adolescent psychiatrist in Finland, she was tasked with opening up Finland's gender clinic a long time ago. And she says that like she looked at she looked at the research and she's like, this is not super strong, but Finland is a small country and I'm told I need to start a gender clinic. And so I'm doing it. So she started a gender clinic and then she published, I think in 20, I think in 2015, that her experience was if the kid came in and they were solid and stable and doing pretty well. And really kind of their only issue was the gender dysphoria. And then they went through the process. They did fine. But if they came in and they had other issues, the transition did not help, did not make anything better. And so she was starting to get, because it was supposed to, you know, the whole idea is that every single problem a gender dysphoric kid has is because of minority stress, right? Like if they're depressed, they're depressed because society is hard on trans kids or if they're anxious they're anxious because it's hard to be trans you know like everything is always attributed back to that one source and then the idea is we're going to put all that aside and we're just going to we're going to plunge ahead with this transition and that will fix everything and then it doesn't for you know mm -hmm. <laughs> it seems like it doesn't so that's what happened in finland in sweden there was sort of a scandal because they had like a investigative news show that found uh, a kid uh, that goes by Leo, at least in the news show, who had been put on puberty blockers for four years and whose bones got so brittle that they suffered um, stress fractures in the spine. And those aren't fixable. So this person is disabled for life with back pain, with an inability to stand for extended periods of time for the rest of their life, as far as I can tell. And that was that was scandalous enough that it, it led to all the other changes in Sweden. And then in England, um, I'm not sure how, well, I guess um, there were a lot of people that quit, right? They had a massive turnover at that clinic and there were some whistleblowers. And then they commissioned Hillary Klass, who is an experienced pediatrician to do a review of the evidence. And she kind of disappeared for a few years, but then she came back and she's like, yeah, this isn't good. We need to we need to shut down this clinic. So they're still working on that in England. How long does it typically uh, take to do a systematic review? What, what, what can we expect with a AAP's I process? I don't think it could be done in less than, I mean, maybe three months, but probably six months. And uh, we'll just have to see what happens. Oh, oh, and I want to get back to. Um, I was about to tell the story, and then I realized I should I should give the history. In the summer of 22, yeah, last summer in August, I published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, which is so weird for me <laughs> as a lifelong liberal, but the Wall Street Journal is the only person, the only uh, paper that's willing to publish this stuff with uh, Lior Sapir, who is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, um, you know, going after the AP and saying that they, they need to look at the evidence, et cetera, et cetera. And then they responded and they were given, you know, and their response was published. And in their response, they said something like, oh, you know, you guys have it wrong for the vast majority of kids. Uh, affirmation does not mean medical medicalization. I, I thought, yeah, they said affirmation doesn't necessarily mean medicalization. In fact, for the vast majority of kids, it's the exact opposite. And my response was like, awesome. Tell me more about this. Tell me more about this new definition of affirmative care. So they were already doing it a year ago, sort of saying like, oh, no, no, you, you've, you misunderstood us. You know, affirmative care doesn't mean medicalization and it's like well if you look at the 2018 statement it, it totally but they does. just reaffirmed which they just reaffirmed yes but that's the thing they're, they're just going to do a lot of double talking they're just going to tap dance real fast for the next year or so and you know they're trying to not activate the the trans rights activists against them i think and then they also have to deal with all the true believers so I would guess that the people who are in AAP leadership are not true believers. They just kind of got caught 
And then they circled the wagons and tried to just shut down all dissent. And now they're figuring out that that is not, that's not working. That's not happening. So I'm really glad to see that, but they're still trying to play off both sides. So we'll just have to see what happens. I do feel, you know, people have asked, you know, what do we feel about people being able to backpedal? And I think it depends on who we're talking about. I mean, I think people that were maybe misled and, and, innocently just sort of bought into this because someone else told them or the, you know, the ex what you were saying about that, that chain of trust, that if the expert said, and people were innocently led into this, I think they sh should be able to, I think, change their mind based on the evidence. But there are people that I feel have really broken the public trust in ways that I don't, I don't feel like I don't want to let them backpedal and save face. And <laughs> I know it's really, it's really hard. I don't like we're, we're, we're sort of at the, we're getting to the cleanup phase of the op opioid scandal. Right. So I was in medical school. I started medical school in the 1980s. That's how old I am. And um, right when I was in medical school in the late eighties, there was this push to be like, pain is the fifth vital sign. You have to ask every patient about their level of pain and they need to give you a number. And then it's your job to get that number down. You know, And so they were just literally in medical school pushing it on us that it's our job to relieve pain. And this was totally coming from the drug companies who thought that they had a fabulous new medicine that somehow, despite being an opioid, was not addictive and that was completely bogus <laughs> that was oxycontin mostly you know and so that was this huge thing from the top down where they were telling the doctors this is your job you're the doctor you need to fix the pain and oh here you go this is how you do it you know here's the med and i i remember 20 years ago when I was practicing in Wisconsin, there was a family medicine doc and I don't think he was a bad guy. He was just very soft hearted and he tended to believe what people told him. And the word was just out. Everybody went to him if they wanted opiates because he was known to just very easily write those prescriptions. And then I think he did get in trouble, but yeah. Is it his fault? I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And then I, Parallels are so so direct. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, what's going to happen here? I don't know. What do I want to happen? I want medicine to go back. Well, medicine has never been evidence based. What am I talking about? Um, we keep Wait, trying. Could you, could you expand on that? <laughs> we keep trying. I mean, I actually, I um, I started school with an MSTP fellowship, so medical scientist training program. And I was going to get an MD and a PhD. And um, and then what was interesting to me is it paid for everything and it gave me money to live on. So that was pretty cool. That was that was the appealing part to me is to get my medical degree and not be in debt. And I did my first year of medicine, medical school at University of Illinois, Chicago with that MSTP fellowship. And um, but then I realized that none of the PhDs that I could get at UIC is what I wanted to do. And so I transferred to the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, which is a much bigger university. It's huge. It's like 80,000 students and um, has a lot more, you know, PhD degrees. But I had to give up my fellowship and I, I joined something called the Medical Scholars Program. And they really tried to talk to us about evidence-based medicine. It was kind of a new thing then. And the idea that we were going to be more scientific and not just like do commissions of, of learned, you know, old doctors and listen to what they say from their experience, but actually try to look. So there's, there's been some fascinating things. Do you know, they actually did sham heart surgery once they did a, they did a randomized control trial where they cut into people and did not actually do the surgery. And it showed that it didn't make any difference for this wow. one thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't think they were cracking chests. I, th I think they were going into the vessels from the side, but still it's like, wow, how, who signs up for that? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I, that's people. a big thing. 
when I was in med school was like, for decades, we've told people with back pain that they need to do bed rest. And actually that's totally wrong. You know, like the worst thing to do when you have back pain is to stop moving. You have to keep moving. And the way it was explained to me, and this, this applies to any joint, there are parts of our joints that only get fed via movement. Like they don't really have a blood vessel that goes to them and feeds them. They live off of the joint fluid. And so the joint needs to move. So if you break a bone and you wear a cast for six weeks, when you take that cast off, the joint that was immobilized is super unhappy and it takes a while for it to come back. So if I don't have a serious injury, I really like to put a removable brace on it and then tell the person you wear this brace when you're at risk, but then every night I want you to take it off and like move, you know, move the joints because that's how they, that's how they eat. Um, anyway, so they were pushing on us back pain and, you know, various things. So evidence-based medicine is a relatively new field and definitely we're not running entirely. You know, there's so many examples of medicine changing their mind, right? We were telling all menopausal women that they should be taking hormone replacement therapy. And then we're like, oh, actually there's a higher death rate in the people who are doing the hormone replacement therapy. So now that's out of fashion. And it tends to be this pendulum that swings, right? So like now, even if you might be a person who benefits from that, you're gonna have a hard time getting it because everyone decided it was bad. Or when I started out in pediatrics, they were taking tonsils out left, right, and center. And so the parents of my patients will be like, well, I had my third strep infection and they took my tonsils out. And I was like, yeah, we don't do that anymore. You know? So like they were taking everybody's tonsils out and I was like, nope, we're not going to do that anymore. And in pediatrics for decades, for 30, 40 years, we thought that the way you get food allergies is the protein from the food gets into your blood because we'd noticed that entire proteins from mom's milk end up in the blood of little newborn babies. And we thought, wow, babies must have leaky guts. And actually, I think it's probably a very complex system with specific receptors that grab the specific protein from the gut and move it into the blood because it's an antibody or it's a iron holding protein or, you know, it's probably a lot more complicated than they thought, but they're like, oh, babies have leaky guts. Maybe that's how they get allergies. Like you feed the baby peanut butter and then peanut gets into the blood and then the body mounts an immune response to the peanut protein and ta-da, you have a peanut allergy. It was a logical, like it all made sense. It was just all totally wrong. And so we told parents, don't give anything but breast milk or formula till they're six months old. And then you start with rice cereal because who's allergic to rice? And then you start the foods one at a time, but all of the common allergens you delay. So you don't give cow's milk till they're one. You don't give eggs till they're one. You don't give strawberries till they're one. You don't give peanuts till they're two. And we, if we were right, then the incidence of food allergies should have gone down, but we were totally wrong. And the incidence of food allergies was just going up and up and up until a British allergist went to Israel where they've got a snack called Bamba and it's peanut butter puffs. And uh, instead of being cheese puffs, it's peanut butter puffs. <laughs> and he noticed people giving these to babies. And he's like, wait a second, thought we weren't supposed to give peanuts to babies. And he gave his talk to this like conference of Israeli allergists. It wasn't about peanuts, but then he's like, okay, I got a room full of Israeli allergists. I got to ask y'all, how many of you have a patient with a peanut allergy? And only some of them raise their hands. And he's like, wow, if I was in England, we'd all like, we all have dozens. So then he ran an experiment where um, he got a bunch of kids who were the younger sibs of his patients. So they were considered to be at high risk. And then half of them uh, were, and then they get, you know, matched groups. And then half of them were given the usual advice, no peanuts till they're two. And the other half are like, we want your baby to get three grams of peanut three times a week. And here's, here's how many puffs they have to eat. And here's a bunch of puffs. And the babies that were deliberately given peanut had a lower rate of peanut allergy. It wasn't zero, but it was lower. And that blew up all of our rules. So now I'm like, the only rules I have is you don't want to do anything that's an infection risk and you don't want to do anything that's a choking risk. But all those rules, Aaron, you probably remember that. Um, 
because your kid's the age that yeah. got all the rules. Yeah. yeah. And my kid, and, and she had tons of food allergies. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry about She's that. She's outgrown them now, but yeah, she was yeah. allergic to everything for a while. But <laughs> the when ring I, of, the ring of fire on both ends. Yeah. And, and the, but you know, like on that chain of trust thing, when I was a young pediatrician, I was all like, you can't give anything but breast milk until they're six months old, you know? And I believed it because that's what I'd been told. And why would I not believe it? It sounds like medicine you, to your point that it's never been evidence-based. So it sounds like it, it develops by hypothesis that's then yeah. put into practice. And then the evidence comes out, whether that hypothesis was true or not. It does seem to be that way. And yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. I, I was going to say, is that, is that capitalism when it comes to new drugs? I think capitalism is part of it, you know, that in the United States, we have a for-profit medical system and that creates all kinds of weird incentives. But on the topic of gender, it really, it started moving in Holland, you know, it started moving in, in the Netherlands and then it went on in England and Finland and Sweden, which none of them have for profit medicine. It went crazy in in the United States. And I think we're going to have the hardest time dialing it back in the United States. But I don't know. Canada's um, or Canada seems you're right. Bad. And then, yeah, Canada for different just, reasons, like, though, confuses right? everything. Yeah. So basically, we're not going to get the. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, dog. She's back. <laughs> yes, that's very uh, exciting. Yes. Uh, uh, I keep, I've been, you know, yeah, just ho assuming and hoping that there's going to be a massive, you know, reckoning, a massive uh, holding people to account. I'm like, I'm envisioning, you know, the who holding, you know, Nuremberg style trials to figure <laughs> out, you know, and, and now I'm like, okay, well, so nope, <laughs> we're no. just going to be like, oh, we were wrong, move on. That's okay. yeah, yeah. Because well, if you think about the um, the satanic panic, right? The idea that preschool children were being subjected to satanic rituals at daycare, and what's really funny is that Diane Aronsoft, who is a psychologist at UCSF, and who says that if you have a little toddler girl and she rips the barrettes out of her hair, she's making a gendered statement. She's saying um, that she's not a girl, but she doesn't have any words. So it's a non, she says that pre-verbal children can tell you that they have been misgendered by their behaviors or. Uh, I went to the San Francisco, example. I went mm -hmm. to the, the San Francisco Trans Health Summit and she said that again, she gave that exact oh same God. example. She's, she's sticking also with it. The, the one, yeah, it's like, I assumed that it was something that was recorded and that, you know, the gender critics just keep repeating it because it's so ridiculous, but no, she repeatedly she says really it. She believes was saying that. it as, yeah. Yeah, as recently well, she as a few months ago. She published on the satanic panic. She was a believer. She's basically, if she has a golden thread, it's believe the child. You know, that's her thing. She thinks that children are like innocent, pure beings of nothing but truth. And I don't know how she deals with. You the would think Easter that some, you would think Santa that Claus and all that. But. Yeah, you would think someone like that would be held to, held to account. I mean, that if she's if she bought into the satanic panic and now she's bought into the the gender woo i mean that's two strikes against her she's she's obviously has a vulnerability right to yeah. to accepting these and, and the thing is, and people went to prison people were wrongfully accused and convicted and sent to prison on the basis of this sort of repressed memory stuff that was just a fad it was a psychological fad, the idea that a person could have a horrific experience and then bury it. And then the, the, the most clever therapist could pull it out of them. And what you pull out of their memory is the truth and can be used as a basis to put someone in prison. So, you know, I don't know what's worse, like people losing their sexual function for the rest of their lives, people losing their freedom, you know, it's all bad, but but that just sort of quietly sank without a trace. There was not a big reckoning. There was, I mean, obviously there wasn't a reckoning for Diane Aronsoff. She's doing talks to big groups of doctors and they're all applauding. So, so the reason I keep things... thinking, it, it, the reason I keep thinking it's it's so different in this instance is because it's so visible. Somebody going to prison, that that's literally invisible. Um, but what we're 
where we're talking, or you know, not literally, but you know what I mean. It's 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 yeah. it's not visible. Um, right. What we're talking about is children's entire bodies being altered irreversibly. We are going to be surrounded by the proof of this for a generation, yeah. and and it's and we also the age of social media where all of this people's passionate opinions endorsing this are all. Put We've got the receipts. Public. We have the receipts, right? And, yeah. and yeah, again, so it's not, yeah, not the receipts and the physical evidence are not going anywhere. It's not something that can, like people are like, oh, it's just going to be memory hold. Yes, there's going to be, you know, uh, attempts like the AAP is already engaging in uh, mm-hmm. of memory holding and doing this, this saying this, but meaning this and meaning like they can keep doing that. But the evidence of the harm is going to be forever, you know, it's going to be visible for an entire generation. So that's why it just seems like, this is this has got to be different, right? I mean, that's what I keep holding uh, on to. I mean, it's everything's different. Everything is different. This is this is this is bizarre. The way this came about is really bizarre. So maybe the way that it ends will be completely new, and we just don't know. We don't know how it's going to go. Just in the past, medicine has made mistakes, and it tends to just be, you know, the guy that came up with lobotomies won a Nobel Prize for medicine, and he was not subsequently put in jail. It's just that, and I don't think that lobotomies would have disappeared as quickly as they did, except that Thorazine became available. And so there was a way to chemically sort of zombify people. That's the medicine they're giving people in one flew over the cuckoo's nest, you know, and it kind of just not takes you out. So I don't know. Human nature is such that, you know, it's like mistakes were made but not by me, you know, like that, that seems to be how things go. And the people with the power are the ones that decide how it goes. And so, yeah, I don't know. We'll and there's also the parents. Helen, Helen Joyce made a really good point recently when she, I think she was talking to Peter Bogosian on his show and she was basically saying how um, it's it's going to be the parents who are the, the longest clingers to uh, this having been the, the right call, just because, you know, you, you know, it's one thing to admit to yourself that you made a mistake by doing something, you know, t- to yourself. And it's another thing or doctors, you know, certainly not, not the lawyer at the head of the AAP, mm-hmm. but, you know, an individual doctor can say, you know, that they're less inclined, but they could say, you know, you know, that was a mistake. I'm sorry, we shouldn't have done that. But how does a parent reckon with with making that decision for their child? Um, that's, I think that's going to be a whole nother uh, yeah, kettle of trauma. Oh, it's awful. It's mm-hmm. awful. And it's, you know, I've already seen this. I know there was like, there was a judge in California and she was presiding over a custody case where the mom wanted to transition the kid and the dad did not. And she, she very much, you know, was sort of against the father and she never revealed the fact that she had a gender dysphoric kid that she was actively transitioning. It seems like a conflict of interest. And, and Helen Joyce talks about how over and over again, she's been told sort of, you know, by back channels, oh, you're not going to get anywhere with that organization because the vice president has a trans kid or, you know, whatever, like once, yeah, once there's one person in an organization who has bought into this, then the whole organization is sort of stuck because nobody wants to say to Mrs. Smith, that she's crazy and she's, you know, doing the wrong thing. And so everybody just, you spiral of silence, like you mentioned before. Uh, <laughs> every sign. Uh, so. Where does it go? I yeah. don't know. I don't know, but it is a good thing. We Now we just have to watch the AP. They said something about, they had sort of boilerplate in their press release about doing the systematic review and looking at the evidence about um, in the instance, in the interests of transparency that they would um, involve a, a number of stakeholders. And I really think that that was just bog standard DEI talk for like, we're gonna have trans people on this committee, but I want to push on that and say, you know, you need to have detransitioners on this committee. You need to have the parents on this committee, parents who are supporting their kid and parents who aren't supporting their kid. Like we need parents on this committee and you need some pediatricians who aren't doing this for a living. Well, that's Um, just it. I thought, I thought referring to 
the AAP has released a statement. We can link to it in the show notes, basically describing what they did. I mean, everybody read about it probably in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal because that came out faster. But then the next day, the AAP had a like a formal press release on this topic saying both that they were, you know, re-upping the 2018 statement and that they were going to do a systematic review of the evidence. So what I'm wondering is why, so there's a committee associated with doing the, a systematic I'm review of the evidence? I'm saying committee, they didn't say committee, um, oh. but, but they did say that they're going to include stakeholders in the process. I thought the whole point of a systematic review is that you eliminate bias and conflict of interest by not Good including point. stakeholders. Yes, you're good. Good point. I, I guess they were talking about the process of looking at the results from the systematic review of the evidence, because you're right. A systematic review of the evidence does not have stakeholders. That is completely against with a systematic review of the evidence. You're trying your hardest to eliminate all bias. And so like uh, Mr. Del Monte already sort of, you know, raised red flags for me. Because he was like, well, we're confident that the review will blah, 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 you know, and it's like, well, now you're already violating the idea of equipoise. You need to go into your, your review with an open mind. It could go this way or it could go that way. We don't know. We're going to look at the, you know, we're going to look at the evidence and follow where it takes us. And he's already making statements that, that are like, not even so even if they do and uh, like because obviously as you said how, how the systematic review of the evidence works is they have to you know previously publish their search criteria you know the time frame everything so it can be replicated um so that's great but you know, when they're saying involving having stakeholders involved that sounds like even you know even if the systematic review of the evidence is entirely pure as it should be it might be presented in a way that is favorable to uh to said stakeholders is that yeah. kind of what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering, again, with the AAP's um, uh, funding, and like I, I, you looked into their funding, um, I'm, how yeah. much of this is coming from? Um, well, so so recently, I, yeah, I was um, reading an article. Uh, I can't remember where it was. It was something that Leo Leor Sapir had had linked on Twitter mm -hmm. that I was reading about uh, something that's going on at the American Academy of Psychiatry or, or Adolescent Psychiatry. Do you know what I'm referring to? Where three times they tried mm -hmm. to have um, uh, that Finnish uh, uh, pediatrician, you mentioned that I can't pronounce her name, they were having her and um, uh -huh. a few other um, uh, European uh, uh, to clinicians. present their evidence. Yeah, right, and, yeah I think right. it is that the American... Psychological Association, Psych and they're having yeah. a meeting. They're having they're having their meeting in in October in New York City, and it was a, an article in the Free Beacon. I haven't read it, but I saw the reference to it. Yeah, nice. and they're okay. like, yeah, no, yeah. we won't listen to you. We don't want to hear about how you're doing it in Europe. Right, it's one individual. It's somebody named Aaron Jansen who is the the head of the gender division of the because it's the American mm -hmm. Academy of Psychiatry for adult children and adolescents. It's specifically uh, pediatric, okay. and the, I remember it's psychiatry, um, and uh, because it's yeah different from yeah psychology. I remember, but um, uh, and it's the head of that department who unilaterally basically because they have all these you know different people coming and presenting on different topics and this is the third time that he has struck down the invitation of those specific presenters um and i looked up that individual and he's on the uh he's on the the, the pritzker foundation or something mm, um yeah, when right, i so. when i and so i'm wondering if something similar is going on at the aap where there is um, right there's definitely financial are big yeah. in illinois in chicago and the AP is based in Chicago. So that's a question. It's an excellent question. And I, I don't know the answer. I found the statement. I can, I can read it out loud. Please. Um, but, okay. So this is from the AP press release. The board reviews evidence and considers policy renewal on a regular schedule as authorizations expire. Based on the continuing review, the board reaffirmed the current guidance on transgender care until there is an updated version. To ensure the policy update process is transparent and inclusive, the AAP will invite members and other stakeholders to share input. So the stakeholders part is they're saying we're reaffirming the 2018, but we're also going to update it 
starting now, I guess. They don't really so, say how. So that the, the, the stakeholder interest is of the statement that they've reaffirmed, not right. But yeah, with the so they're gonna it's the, a the policy update process is gonna have people. Uh okay. Policy okay. update process. So yeah, so they renewed it, but they're also planning to update it, which they should have done by now, but now they're gonna start now. <laughs> they changed the schedule. So do you think they have after changed they the do... conditions of the deal? Pray they don't alter them again. <laughs> So every five years, right? They they uh they update these this statement. Um, so they reaffirmed it at the same time that they're launching this um, uh, evidence review. Are you yes. thinking that again that they're that they're just going to keep that statement for the next five years, despite whatever comes back from the evidence oh, review? Oh man, or... no, I don't. I don't think they're. I don't think they're going to be that brazen. I think that okay. they're going to try to update it as quietly as possible. And just and inter and and sort of introduce more flexibility for what you can do with a gender dysphoric child, because right now it's just spelling out medical transition. Okay, maybe they're going to lean a little bit heavier on his second sentence about the the, the watchful kind of, waiting. Yeah. Well, right now it's like it says that's bad. You can't do that. So yeah, they're <laughs> going to have to change that part. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how they're going to do it. They're, I think they're just going to, they're just sort of ducking their heads down and hoping that it all blows over. I, I don't know. I, I, I felt like the AP kind of put themselves at sort of an existential risk because they could be named as a plaintiff, you know, they could be blamed because the endocrine society came out with their um, guidelines in 2017. So they came out prior to the AAP, but they were very clear on saying, we have no idea how you pick which children to do this to. We're just the mechanics. We're just like, we can tell you how it's done, but we can't tell you who to do this to. That is not our thing. We are the endocrinologist. And then the American Academy of Pediatrics just leapt into that breach. And they're like, oh, oh, we'll tell you. We'll tell you how to tell which kids. You ask them. You just ask them. And if they say they're trans, then they are trans. And we're off to the races. And what could possibly go wrong? <sighs> so we're about to find know, out. I feel like in a court of law, they might be held responsible you know like the endocrinologist might be like well i was just doing what my society said and then the endocrine society says well we were just you know we were just saying how it's done we weren't saying this particular child who was harmed should have been treated and yeah the blame goes back to the aap because they literally said this is how you tell you ask but so the AAP isn't actually responsible for writing guidelines or standards of care, right? No. They are going to be defaulting to where? WPATH. Yeah. Right? Yeah, WPATH. And I think I think that's where where all the responsibility lies. Yes, obviously people at the AAP should have known better and should not have, you know, you know, Jason Rafferty's, you know, opinion piece should not have been, you know, medical advice. Official. But yeah, yeah but it's still the AAP is still relying on WPATH for their standards of care. And, right. and that is where I think all the responsibility lies. Uh, not, I mean, yes, again, yeah. I think yeah. the, the finger yeah, pointing yeah. is going to be so circular because, you know, I mean, trans activists have really pushed for this, but now who are the trans activists? I mean, I know that when I transitioned almost, you know, six, 16 years ago, nobody explained to me what gender dysphoria was. So mm -hmm. if you've got all these trans people that have been through the system never told any evidence-based information about what is autogonophilia, what is, you know, childhood onset gender dysphoria. And so we're left to kind of develop a narrative for ourselves that we can just feel good about and get on with our day. And some of those narratives are bizarre, right? But it, it we're left, as patients, we're left to do that because you can't really build a self-concept otherwise. 
so now our, our so it's a sort of like who's who's the original blame here is it the clinicians that are to blame is it the trans activists who are to blame and then the wpath is going to say well we were, we just developed these policies because that's what the trans activists said that they wanted and so there's just going to be a lot of finger pointing right, right? It, it, yeah all over the place what? about who, where the original blame comes from but still i mean the wpath calls themselves the world professional association for transgender yeah. health i always say they identify as a <laughs> professional association because yeah. they definitely aren't aren't advocating for evidence-based medicine right and it's not just that activists because activists shouldn't like like aaron you're saying like point at the at but so so it's never an activist job to to give medical advice or to write medical guidelines. So the A, so the WPATH, even if they were influenced high, heavily by activists, and they were, so what? That's not the activist's fault. You know, it's their job. You know, mm -hmm. activists mm -hmm. are going to, you know, advocate and they're going to, that's what they do, but they're not, they, they should, they're not writing medical guidelines. WPATH is. But at WPATH, that, that there is, in a lot of cases, no line between a clinician and a trans activist because many of them are trans activists first and clinicians second. And so in that case, absolutely, those activists are at fault and should be held to account uh, and held responsible in my mm -hmm. view. But in, mo in a, I would say at least half of WPATH, um, there, there is not a distinction between a trans activist. Well, in all of, all of WPATH, there isn't a distinction between a, a clinician and an activist. But a lot of those clinicians are simultaneously trans yeah. themselves, right. um, and uh, but but I mean yeah, all of them are activists. It's just that that yeah, a significant number of them are also uh, personally invested in this healthcare yeah. or lack thereof. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. yeah, can WPATH be redeemed? I don't know. No, no. <laughs> no. I mean, no. I'm hoping that the AAP can be redeemed, that they can like do reverse ferret and be like, oh, wow, sorry. Like, you know, because I think that overall they do good things, I think. <laughs> but um, yeah, WPATH, I don't, I don't know. They, you know, it started out as the Harry Benjamin Society and that guy was a quack. So but even even then, they were just so much more cautious and re like yeah it's just, yeah they, they they had the crazy name, but they actually were a lot more cautious than they are now. Right, right. It, it's just what yeah. it is now. I mean, like, people, I don't know how people can read the standards of care eight and think that there's any you know actual evidence or or medicine that went into that document yeah. at all. I mean, there's literally well, when they, a chapter when they on the, castration. Yeah, they dropped the ethics chapter and they kept the eunuch chapter, and that's like yeah. I was like, okay. There you go. Yeah. WPATH is lost. They have like completely lost the plot. They've been taken over by activists. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, thank you so much for being here, Julia. It's been yeah. very, very informative. All right. Good to I, talk to you guys. Yeah, it's been been a pleasure to talk to you. Right. I, 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 I maintain hope that we're not going to go the satanic panic uh, route, but I just... Yeah, I've, I I I don't have bloodlust. This is like the one topic where it's like I'm not I'm not usually like a justice seeking kind of person. It's like oh mm -hmm. people make mistakes, bad things happen. Let's all move on, you know, if, you know. But in this case, I was like I want heads to roll. Like I just really do. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know why, but I just really do. <laughs> no, no, you, you're not wrong. I just I um I'm old. That's what it is. <laughs> You're like, I'm tired. I'm Let's just, just make it I'm stop. I'm just like, whatever. Call just it a make day. it stop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, fair. Just please. Can we stop? Yeah. Well, and you had a massive hand. We are stopping, I think. You know, I think that's where we're heading. And I think you had a, a massive, massive role to play in that. And your, uh, yeah, persistence and and getting them to. Right. I have been insistent, the, persistent, and consistent <laughs> in my efforts. <laughs> Yes, you have. <laughs> to get the AAP to stop listening to six-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Transparency Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please help out our algorithm by hitting like or subscribe. If you'd like to make a donation, follow the link to our PayPal account. On behalf of the Gender Dysphoria Alliance, thanks for your support.